Um, okay. Uh, do you know how much time I have or how much time this we meet for this uh, section? Three hours. <laughs> One three hours. Okay, that's right. Um, Dr. 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 Flowers may come in and do the introduction. He's no, he did it on yesterday, so brother. Okay, okay, okay. I don't know if that's the okay. format for today. Oh, there he is, right there. Okay. He's act, he actually has two devices. He's, he's monitoring oh, okay. on this one, and he's. All right. Um, good morning. Can y'all hear me? Oh, there you go. Gotcha. Good morning, Dr. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so um, to, to the members, the valued members of cohort 2024, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to um, introduce to you all Dr. Robert Wafuanaka, who's going to come and to share with you today. Um, one of our um, esteemed colleagues here at, at, at STBU, really in the areas of biblical studies and is it New Testament, Old Testament? I always get it confused, Doc. It's the Old Testament, Old right? Old Testament, yes. Old Testament, yeah. Um, so he's just going to come and talk to you all today about um, this developing of the foundations, the biblical foundations. And so um, I'll turn it over to you, Doc. Is there anything you need from me before I jump back into the other room, sir? Um, no, how much time do we have for our session? Well, it's a, it's a three hour session, but you and I talked about your okay. obligation for later. Okay. So when you when you get finished, you can let them go. Okay. Um, and then they just need to be back in, in this room um, at 1.30. And so they, they know okay. that. So um, 10.30, whatever time you finish, 11 o'clock, yeah, you can let them go and then we'll reconvene at 1.30. Okay. But thank you, sir, All so right. much. Thank you very much, Dr. Flowers. And uh, once again, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to uh, this uh, session. Um, well, I'm, I will be your leader this morning. My name is Dr. Afuanaka. I've been teaching here at uh, STVU uh, for 22 years now, in my 23rd year. Uh, and I've taught some of you, and uh, some of you I have not taught as yet. So I welcome you to Virginia Union University. I welcome you to uh, the DMIN program, uh, our highest degree. And uh, before we begin, maybe we can just go around and do uh, a quick round of uh, introductions. And uh, uh, if you can, you can let the class know, know what you're working on or maybe what your texts are uh, so that we can have some perspective. Uh, you can just go around and uh, I don't have any chronological list, but just go ahead and introduce yourself first. Dr. Wafawanaka, I have you at Payne and I am happy to be in this virtual space with you. I am Jerry Wright. I will be, I'm, I'm toiling with several scriptures. Um, this is our, first year, second semester. And so I'm still wrestling with some things, wrestling with some things as it pertains to um, healing mm -hmm. and what the church calls prison ministry, but really ministering to the, the total being of the formerly incarcerated and what that looks like. So I'm not quite sure, but I have several in mind. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet and, you. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, at uh, the end, I think we can open up uh, for questions and further discussion after my presentation. Thank you very much. You. Uh, next person. Um, good morning. My name is Only Love Chica Alston. And I have heard great things about you and your work. Um, my project, my focus is the global leadership track and my project is going to focus on um, looking at um, African Jewish um, interpretations of Torah in the Hebrew Bible and how those interpretations could be utilized to help build faith-based justice initiatives. Um, in um, African-American churches. I do a great work with Jews in Africa, especially Ghana and Nigeria and East and Southern Africa. And so I'm really trying to examine the ways in which African Jews in particular 
look at the mm -hmm. Tanakh and um, the passages around justice to work for justice in their communities and what we in the diaspora could learn from them. So some of the texts that I'm going to be focused on are um, the prophetic writings, um, you know, from Isaiah, Amos that have been utilized in the civil rights movement from a Christian perspective, but I'm really trying to um, uncover what African Jews in particular have to say um, in relation to these texts and how they use them for their own particular social movements, whether it's Ugandan Jewish women and their movement around women's empowerment or Igbo Jews and their movement around um, the issues that they face in Nigeria. So I'm still working it out into a codified question, but um, I'm really excited to meet you and hear from you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, that's an interesting area. You've got a very large uh, context. Uh, I'm teaching a class on the prophets right now. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. So how do I get in that class? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to join the class, but uh, thank you very much. Okay, okay, our next presenter. Um, good, morning. good morning. I'm Gloria Fudge, and I had to jump because I do have another class I got to be part of. I'm a professor here at VUU and I'm teaching in the Sydney Little School of Business. But um, my main uh, focus is on the Black church and social concerns today. Uh, my husband is a pastor, and we do have a church, and I see a great falling away of our members and um, I want to dig deeper and to see what is causing this. Why are people getting what they call church hurt? Um, what is happening with our people and why they don't feel the need to, to be embodied in a church or to be part of a church? Um, so that's my main focus. And I'm trying to um, dig deeper into that and see exactly what the reason is and what we can do to remedy that situation and to see if we can... Uh, Open up, I can find ways to open up a little bit more about what people are looking for now and not getting in the Black church in America today. So nice meeting you, sir. God bless you. Nice to meet you, my colleague. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yes, yes sir. All right. Good morning. I'm Shantaria Sampson. And when my husband was consecrated bishop in 2010, our assignment was essentially to go into the marketplace. Um, that was the assignment that the Archbishop gave us. So in um, concert with that or to work that mission, we ended up developing an organization called OHUB or Opportunity Hub. And at the most basic level, our goal was to break poverty. Um, before he was consecrated, we started streaming faith. So with that, our mission was, you know, go ye into all the world. We wanted to reach a billion people with the message of Christ. And that's an ongoing concern for 20 years. And then with the marketplace, I'll, I'll say marketplace ministry to keep it simple. Um, but much of that is still um, like global or online. So we have this, you know, overarching or global sense of ministry but what we have found in dealing with the young people as we move them into their first jobs in tech we are finding that tech of course is very hostile very discriminatory and we're finding that when the young people learn how to program computers or code as they call it they um it's almost like the way that you were raised mm -hmm is how you will process it. So the crying, um, it's almost like beating yourself up, you know, when you get something wrong. So mm -hmm. we're trying, we've been working, I guess for the past couple of years to um, ensure like mental wellness because we already know it's a hostile industry, but then how do we shore them up as they go forward and move into tech. And we know, or we find that most of them do have roots in the church. They grew up in the church. So I'm also looking at it in terms of like the church as mother or the black church as mother in terms of mental wellness, that if this, a certain level of, um, 
I, I, I'm, I have to determine exactly how I want to coin it or phrase it. But okay. if there was a certain uh, united way that we raised children beyond, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, like it, we, we can't continue to raise slaves. So how do we talk to the two-year-old and grow these people up so that once they're older, but it's sort mm -hmm. of concerted throughout. So I'm still, I'll say struggling to kind of focus all the way in, but I know that the main focus would be mother in terms of how we talk to, how we teach, how we raise. So the black church is mother, but then still not only a ministry to mothers because we need men, we need everyone to do this. Right. And, and and with the focus being right like all. slavery. Say that right. again. What did you say? I think uh, Range uh, Jones, I think you said something. I thought I, I just finished out your introduction. Go ahead. Ms. Samson. Oh, so just looking at it from like a post-slave traumatic disorder and how to break that, because my understanding is for every year of slavery, it takes five years to heal. So we need a miracle because we can't wait or go 2,000 years. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, another very rich context. You have to do quite a bit of digging, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to uh, find your foundations along with your advisor and craft that document appropriately. Uh, thank you. All right, thank next you. person to introduce themselves. I'm um, Reginald Jones, and my project is um, Church Growth Through Discipleship in a Rural Black Church, meaning in the church's first Amy Zan Church in Lovingston, Virginia. And my scripture for foundation is um, Matthew 8, 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came and told the disciples, I haven't given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I will be with you all ways, even to the end of the age. Church group meeting physically, but not more important physically. Knowledge and in spirituality, because in a small context, you might not never get a mega church, but you can grow the still grow the people. Uh, my problem um, statement is why there why is there a lack? There's a lack of discipleship in our church, and a hypothesis that this there has been um, there has been no dis, no discipleship training in this church. And the church is about 22 years old. I've only been there about eight years. Um, biblical foundation, I said that theological um, anthropology to study people and their learning habits. My methodology, I'm, I kind of out on that, but it's um, ethnogra ethnographic, relating to people's learning habits and how I plan to attack this problem to fix it is through prayer, training, training in person, multimedia, and training in groups by ages because people are learning, you know, you got your children, your youth, and then your adults through Bible study, church school, and preaching. All right. Thank you very much for sharing another very rich context. Uh, I have worked with students who have uh, worked on uh, similar texts and uh, when you, especially when you talk about discipleship uh, outside of the U.S. context, it has different implications, uh, especially in the, in the African context, uh, because you had uh, missionaries who went to Africa to make disciples of all nations. But what mm -hmm. does it mean to do missions uh, in a foreign land? Uh, what does it mean to teach them? Uh, part of discipling is not only just teaching, but also learning in context. This way, you are able to effectively. Uh, provide your ministry or to your discipleship. Uh, so there's a matter of uh, teaching, but there's also a matter of uh, learning uh, in a particular mm -hmm. context. So knowing your context will help you to teach right. better. All Thank right. You. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, next uh, presenter, please. 
Good morning, um, all. My name is Nyakia Brown, and my research is going to be geared to uh, mental health in the Black community and the connection and bridging the gap of understanding and um, awareness. So it's in, um, looking at generational and generations and how mental health is impacting across the board and how the Black church can be very instrumental in closing the gap and allowing for individuals to be safe, feel safe in pursuits of um, wellness from the mental um, health um, side of things. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Uh, the issue of mental health, that's another issue that uh, we don't usually talk about in our churches, but I'm glad that there are people who are willing to work on that issue and put a spotlight on it uh, because it is an issue that affects uh, us as people of African descent. Uh, so hopefully your project will be able to add F, uh, some insights, uh, some resources that can help people to uh, deal with mental health issues since it is one of those issues that we don't normally uh, talk about. So thank you very much. I want to encourage you to keep working on it and uh, produce a fantastic document uh, for your people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next person to introduce themselves. I'm, uh, I'm Dewey Williams and um, I, I'm, you know, I'm still formulating exactly how my <laughs> Uh, work will will come together. Uh, right now, I'm kind of titling it uh, "Incarcerated Joy," and I uh, worked with uh, those incarcerated on death row. And I have 172 handwritten statements about joy and my sermons that I preached about joy on death row from the men and women, and I want to take their words and formulate how joy uh, resides. Many people go into prison ministry, I think, for wrong motivations, mm -hmm. and they do not see that these individuals are fully human and mm -hmm. still have life and still have something to contribute. So I want to take these contributions that I already have and formulate um, ways that we can present incarceration uh, in a different light. And, you know, I'm not pro-incarceration, but I, they're there and we have a call. And the scripture I would use is uh, Paul and Silas were incarcerated and they sang and prayed. And the scripture says the prisoners heard them. So I want to work on how do you be heard and more than just the physical hearing. Uh, how do you, how do, how do, we get people to hear in their spirit and how do we hear from them? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. I have uh, had a couple of students who have worked on the question of incarceration, uh, but primarily they were concerned about people returning uh, from the prison system. And uh, as returning citizens, what is it that we can do uh, to make sure that when they get back into society, uh, they can adapt and uh, be profitable citizens without uh, going back into the system. Uh, and uh, in some cases, they had to pro put programs within the, within the prison system so that people can learn skills before they get out so that when they come out, uh, they can uh, be productive. Uh, so again, if you're context in the prison ministry, uh, that's another interesting place where perhaps you can also uh, provide some resources that can help people uh, when they come out uh, so that they, yeah. they will stay. Well, the men and women on death row are, we, we've thrown them away. And okay. I, have, I have their words. I have their words and handwritten words okay. about how they have been impacted and how joy resides in them, even though society mm -hmm. has told them they're worthless okay. and uh, their life is not worth living. And so I want to take those words and generate something that will be good for all that are doing prison ministry. Okay, okay, you're very, you're very unique context. Uh, thank you for the work that you, you are doing. All right, next person to introduce themselves. Uh, this is Dr. Opafa Panakas of Quinzel Chestnut. I was your student back in 2009. Oh, yes. And, well, yes, and my project is focused on mental health, but with a, a deeper focus on PTSD mm -hmm. and trying to identify um, people that have returned from combat, combat that have PTSD 
and uh, teaching church leaders how to recognize it and how to respond to it and also uh, helping their families. Okay, thank you. And my, for my scripture is um, Ezekiel 37, uh, the Valley of Dry Bones. Okay. Um, how he prophesied life back into it. And that's how we're going to try to help um, members of uh, members of the military that are veterans that are struggling in order to be able to speak to them um, a word of encouragement and bring them back to life where they may feel like they've died back in a foreign land. Okay. Uh, thank you, Quinzel, and welcome back, and it's good to see you. You too, uh, sir. Yeah, 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 that's an interesting uh, context, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, provide some resources uh, so people can uh, have a second chance uh, at, at life. Thank you. Uh, next person to introduce themselves. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Dr. Waffle Panaka, my name is Reverend Rosalind Hall. I am a former MD of student at Virginia Union. I was in one of your classes during my journey and I graduated in 2007. I was a percussionist at that time and I still am. And um, the focus that I started out thinking about was how our religious mentoring and spiritual mentoring in relationships have influenced our present prophetic voice. And, you know, thinking about how um, persons and um, information that we encountered and a lot from our former enslavers has impacted the way in which we present scripture in whatever capacity we might be functioning in. Um, after present sharing it with Dr. Flowers, I started, he started helping me to see how I was speaking a lot to Black preaching and Black preachers and how that, um, that specific type of preaching impacts the world, really. Um, but then over the course of our journey this week, I started revisiting a topic that is that I'm passionate about and, and I've termed it, or entitled it, The Sacred Strength of Unsilenced Sisters. And the scripture that came, has come to my heart, uh, you know, to pre present um, this particular aspect is about Tamar, how after being um, raped and they looked a lot on, or dealt, dealt a lot with their physical um, assault, but it was an assault on the totality of her being. But after that experience, how she just shut herself off and how she was silenced. And so I want to, I'm, really feeling that about now, about how it feels to just lock yourself up in a sense, how our, we allow our experiences, specifically women, allow our experiences to close us up and to retreat and to not respond to the, call, the urgency of the call that women, I believe, have on, we have on our lives to impact the world with the core of our feminine feminine divinity. All right. Thank you, Reverend Hogue. Uh, good to see you. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. You are yeah. working with one of those very difficult texts in the Bible. But mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, you know, you can uh, find something that is useful uh, for people going through crisis situations. And again, uh, these are texts that sometimes you want to shy away from. But uh, you can... Uh, you know, find some resources and uh, wrestle with them, do some exegesis to try to provide uh, uh, some light uh, in a very difficult uh, situation. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next person to introduce themselves. Yes, my name is Gregory Clark and um, the project that I'm still fleshing out is a transformational reaffirming project for black males. Initially it was gonna be just for black men and now I've, I've recognized for me being a football coach dealing with young men that it has to be black males because we have to get them a little earlier. We can't wait till they get to manhood. Basically is a project that allows them to unpack themselves and to see themselves not only through the process of having mentorship, but also from the process of being able to be exposed to allowing themselves for mental health processes for them to either discuss and for them to unpack because there are a lot of times that we as black males 
are not open when it comes to our mental health. So create a project that allows them to be open in the space to recognize that mental health is just as powerful and positive as their physical health. No. All right, thank you. I'm seeing some common threads question of mental health, it keeps coming up, uh, which means that it's an important uh, subject to address. And uh, I've also heard in the past, uh, a student who wrote on uh, mentoring men, I uh, think probably some about 10 or so years ago. Uh, so that issue of mentorship, that's an important uh, uh, issue. And again, we can reach our young men, young males uh, at a young age, hopefully we can mentor them and show them the right way to succeed in life. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next person to introduce themselves. Yes, good morning, professor. Good morning, class. Uh, my name is Melaine Rochford, and um, I've decided to focus my topic around the children of clergy leaders and examining the systems of support that currently exist or may need to be created for the children of clergy families, um, especially Black clergy families, um, in order for them to thrive mentally, physically, spiritually emotionally, and I'd like to really take a closer look at the female children of clergy leaders because I believe some of the challenges they face are unique um, and different from their male siblings, if they have a male sibling. Um, and so I'm looking to do qualitative research like interviews, surveys. I'd also like to examine the media depictions of preacher's daughters. And so how we're depicted in film, in television, in novels, um, that sort of thing. And so I'm still trying to hone in on what biblical texts will undergird this project. And so I'm thinking through um, some of the daughters of kings or um, the fathers of the faith, but I still really haven't kind of pinned which biblical text or texts, plural, I'm going to use. So that's pretty much it. All right, thank you, Melanie. Uh, sounds like a very unique uh, project, uh, unique context. I never encountered it, but hopefully you can uh, write something uh, interesting. But uh, there's variety in the text that you uh, produce. And uh, uh, hopefully you can work close with your advisor to identify resources that you need and also to get the guidance in the direction that you will need. Uh, thank you and welcome. Our next person to introduce themselves. Yes. My name is Rodney Sampson, and I am working on building thriving Black ecosystems in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I want to find out if today's Black institutions, particularly the Black church, can be a direct catalyst for creating new multi-generational wealth for our families, communities, and culture with no reliance on pre-existing multi-generational wealth by taking full advantage of the technology startup and venture ecosystem. Um, I would say spiritual kind of precedence is um, Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I would do a new thing. Um, that's the case for innovation. There's also the case for entrepreneurship and investment at Luke 19 and 13. And then there's the case for divine creation and dominion in Genesis 126, and then the case for inclusive ecosystem building in Acts 4 and 32. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting text. Uh, thank you so much. All right, next person to introduce themselves. I guess that might be me. Um, okay. So my first name is David Jamel. My last name is Williams. I am <clears throat> a one-time graduate from Virginia Union with my mace. I am working on the concentration of global leadership and institutional reform. I want to try to help specifically address the gap between church and community and the church's responsibility in mending that gap, while at the same time also want to refocus on helping train our leaders and ministry to be better and more equipped and more practically applicable leaders in their said respective ministries. Um, with that, that requires people recognizing the difference between chaplaincy and evangelism, for example, things of that nature, helping to be more astute in what they're addressing, who they're addressing, and the purpose of what they're doing it with, and then helping institutions develop proper curriculum to address their specific context and how they try to prepare the next generation of leaders and next generation of community activists and leaders, in a nutshell. All right. Thank you, David, and welcome back. Next person. 
I guess that leaves me as the next person. Uh, good morning, Dr. Wafa. Uh, Wafa. Never get your name right. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we meet again. <laughs> um, yes, we do. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Um, I, I, I want to share briefly. Um, I guess my scripture is incentivized and inspired by two uh, scriptures, Nehemiah 6 and 3, the conversation and the dialogue that Nehemiah is having about building, uh, rebuilding uh, the, the wall. And then Isaiah 58 and 11 through, tw uh, uh, through 12, uh, it, it talks about uh, the repair of the paths and the breach and things of that nature without getting into too much of it. So I am flushing this out as well. And I have two uh, thoughts. And that first one is building and rebuilding the waste places within the kingdom, one church at a time. I'm a church planter. And I've been in discipleship over 20 years. Um, I was invited to go to places like Russia and China to do discipleship um, uh, with uh, the Navigators. I don't know if anybody has heard of them, but they're they're in one, over 100 countries. They are absolutely great. But I plan on writing my own uh, program in terms of the discipleship from what I've seen. Uh, as a church planter, I have seen that most um, white organizations, Foursquare, Southeast Baptist, Right, typically plant churches in um, non-white places in the world that are third world, right? Uh, they have less resources. And what I have found is that <clears throat> they have not planted the church, but they have planted the seeds of missionary work, which creates an enslavement. Um, <clears throat> most of the time that they take their resources and they plant them. They don't go to Philly, they don't go to Harlem, they don't go to bed -Stuy, they don't go to Brownsville, they don't go to uh, uh, Compton, South Cal Compton, uh, 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 California. They go to places where they are unchallenged. And so what, what I see that's happening in the Black church, Pentecostal, Apostolic, Methodist, Baptist, is that we do nothing about that. The other, the other point that I was trying to flush out was finding and unseating the church that's sitting in the pews. <clears throat> Too often we let people, let ministers sit in pews for uh, 30, 40 years because we have no intention there. Now I heard Dr. Flower say, there are many churches out here available. Yes, but unfortunately the, the political scene of getting into those places becomes more difficult. So we have many ministers that are capable and I'm wrapping it up with this, that should be in churches of their own to create a dynamic discipleship and revival force throughout the kingdom of God. All right, very dynamic topic. Thank you, Everett, and welcome back. Uh, next person to introduce themselves. Hello, um, I'm gonna jump in there. Uh, my name is Timony Figueroa, and um, I am still wrestling with, um, I saw someone put in the comments, I think it was um, Ms. Sampson, that um, your, your work is one thing and your calling is another. And so I do realize that my calling is women's ministry and I've been operating in that for quite some time. I'm a pastor's daughter and been in church all my life and realized that, um, that uh, a lot of what I have been through, my struggle, I'm a single mother of three children, I'm divorced. Um, and a lot of what I've been through is um, I have fought through to continue uh, my assignment in ministry. And I realized that that commitment is innate in me. But um, I don't believe that it's because I'm a pastor's daughter or anything like that, because I know uh, pastors, kids who don't stay committed. And so um, it is my burden um, specifically toward women to, um, to help us to balance um, our life in church and our life out of church. And I'm much like um, Elaine Rochford um, as a pastor's daughter that um, many times in ministry, you uh, you function one way and outside you function another way. And so it's my burden to help women to be able to balance their church because God cares about us in the walls uh, or outside of the walls of the church as much as he does inside of the walls of the church. And so it is my burden to help women to be able to balance that. 
um, specifically young women. And so um, I'm definitely still very much working through all of that. All right, thank you very much, Timini, and welcome. Next person to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone, my name is Tim Lucas. Uh, my focus is going to be uh, autism in the Black church, uh, creating resource centers for autistic individuals and their caregivers. Um, I have a son who is autistic. Uh, being in the military, we've been to several churches throughout the years, and none of them address uh, specifically the needs of, of autistic individuals. We just kind of put them in the group with everybody else, uh, give them something to do, and expected them to learn like everybody else. So the intent of my project is to create resource centers to kind of uh, give churches, ministries, nonprofits, uh, some tools to, uh, to help uh, cater or minister to those individuals because they, they, do, they learn different, they hear different, they observe different uh, than, than we do. And they are souls in the kingdom and we have to be concerned about them as well. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Timothy. That's a unique uh, project. I do know some people who are autistic, so hopefully when you write your project and publish your book, uh, that can be a resource for other people. So thank you, welcome. Next person. Hi, Dr. Wafawanaka. Morning. It's Renita. Hi, how are you? Oh, Renita, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, Renita Page. Um, my um, project focuses on the uh, Missio Day. Of the um, of black public theology and my um, centering and guiding texts are um, Luke four um, sixteen through eighteen of course and Deuteronomy um, sixteen twenty uh, uh, justice justice we must per pursue and for you Zadek Zadek teared off so um, hoping to look at how. God manifests um, as Kairos through um, the agency and authority of Black public theology. All right. Thank you very much and you're welcome. Our next person. Did everybody introduce good himself? Good, mo good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Naomi Jordan Cook. And um, my project is uh, seeing ways of how we can go beyond um, the digital, the technology divide, um, ex you know, um, exposing or giving more revelation to the black churches about that, you know, is bigger than the digital divide of how we can just get into resources of different um, technology like manufacturing tech, um, agritech, and being able to use those resources within our churches to help provide better opportunity uh, for our people. And um, it's a pleasure being here. I um, heard great reviews about you, Dr. Uh, Wafanaka, from my family members and also from church members that have attended your class. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, next person. Maybe a few more people left. Uh, Good morning, sir. This Ms. is Jackson. Um, I've had you, um, I had you for biblical <laughs> intro to biblical studies as well as Hebrew. Um, and my work that I'm focusing on is um, social justice as a tool of um, reconciliation and um, allowing um, the African-American church <clears throat> to be in right relationship with God and with humanity. Um, currently, I do not have a text. I'm still working and mulling over all the, the options that I do have, but that is my launching pad. All right, so just a very interesting topic, dear to my heart. Welcome and too good to see you, Miss Jackson. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> next person. Good morning, sir. I am uh, Floyd Harrelson, and I've been at uh, STVU for the last four to five years, and I know you extremely well. I've never taken one of your courses because when I try to register, they're always filled it, and so uh, I have to go some places. Else, but I've been I've sat under many of your uh, two teachings and uh, lectures so and preaching so I'm excited to hear you this morning. My project is going to be targeted on uh, bridging the gap and improving the communication between the church process and uh, re meeting the needs of the unhoused community. Um, uh, they are doing 
services for the unhoused and uh, what we're trying to shore up is, are they actually meeting the needs in establishing relationships, communications, and actually hearing what that community is really looking for from the church, not just to uh, talk about getting saved. Many of them already saved, know the Bible, have a relationship, but are living out of houses for whatever reasons that put them there. So we're looking to shore that up. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Floyd. Welcome. Okay. Uh, next person, probably a couple more people. Or? Is that, is this everybody? So, so uh, uh, my name is Chris Harris. Um, I uh, looking to work, uh, I don't have all pieces quite yet, but uh, my project is, or revolves around ministry in the marketplace, uh, utilizing the creative genius um, uh, within the church to push culture forward. I think too often that the church follows the culture and um, to liberate our people or to show forth the glory of God that the creative genius that's within the church uh, should really set the, the tone um, for culture oh, or drive right. culture. Okay, <laughs> thank you. For Somewhere in there. All right, you'll find your way. Thank you, welcome. Uh, is there anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, my name is Marvin McKenzie. And my project is transformational worship. I haven't uh, selected a, a specific scripture yet. It's based in uh, the music in the church, uh, primarily focusing on hymnals, the use of or the lack of use of uh, hymnals. And I guess that's about the size of it. Music in the church, transformational worship. All right. Thank you very much, Marvin, and welcome. Anyone else? Uh, if there's one more. Uh, Miss Blackmon, I think I see your name there. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Tracy. Um, I work with United Church of Christ uh, in denominational leadership. I'm happy to be in this program and I'm sorry I'm having such trouble this week. I have a lot of fires going on at the denomination and trying to manage both. Um, <clears throat> and the focus of my work or the emphasis of my work at this point, which has shifted, is to uh, create a theological framework for movement work that is rooted in discipleship um, for organizing from the church uh, platform versus organizing from the public square. All right, thank you and welcome everybody. I think that's about everybody, right? All right, and thank you for your attendance, your, your participation. And I had a variety of uh, topics and perspectives uh, which makes uh, for a very uh, rich uh, cohort. And uh, when you write your document, you will have, you will have a chapter on foundations. Uh, and those foundations are usually in chapter three, your biblical foundations, theological foundations, historical foundations, or whatever foundations that you uh, might find. Uh, but my interest uh, as a biblical scholar is simply on the biblical part, the biblical foundations, which is the area where I teach. Uh, the idea that when you look at a biblical text or biblical text that undergrade your project, uh, you must understand that text uh, in its uh, context. Uh, context matters because without context, you can't understand the message. Uh, so the context of anything and everything matters in terms of uh, what it means. Uh, oftentimes, we want to jump to the point where we read something in the text and we, we know what it means without uh, considering uh, the context, uh, the various contexts, what even went before. Uh, so before even you preach your sermon, uh, I know many one of you like to jump to the preaching proclamation point, uh, which is similar to where you are when you pick up a biblical text and you want to apply it to your context. But before you do that, uh, there are some things that you need to know that are fundamental 
uh, to proper uh, exegesis. Uh, uh, so before application, we, we need to go back a little bit and understand some basic things. And once you understand the foundation, the biblical foundations, uh, how to do exegesis, uh, then you can move on to the next step in terms of uh, how do I apply it, whether it's a sermon, whether it is uh, a, a project. Uh, but you must not rush to application without digging through those foundations. And those of you who have had biblical studies, exegesis, or even been in my classes, uh, you are familiar <coughs> with some of those foundations. But uh, reading through Demon projects over the years, uh, one of the areas that seems to be lacking is that our students oftentimes don't have uh, an appreciation of exegesis. They don't dig deep enough. Uh, you know, <clears throat> you read something and people simply uh, touch the surface. Uh, perhaps you might have forgotten your exegesis, but again, uh, as you work on your biblical theological foundations, that is the time to step back and uh, I remember some of the things that you learned about so that you can apply uh, them. Uh, so whatever your, uh, your project uh, is, uh, you will be dealing with a biblical text, whether it is in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, uh, you still need to do the same kind of thing where you do, you do a fair amount of ex exegesis to understand that text in its context, and then you can go on to apply that text. So I simply want to sh show you a few things uh, that pertain to that uh, idea of uh, uh, exegesis, and then you can use whatever you can to try to uh, dig through your, your text. So let me see if I can uh, uh, share a screen if I have that ability. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me pull up this document here. <clears throat> Okay, do you see this document on the screen? Yes. All right. I just tried to put together pretty much uh, you know, my exegesis course just to show you uh, what we do when we do exegesis. And uh, again, uh, you are not expected to do all these things, but at least uh, to be familiar with the ex exegetical process because that's part of our, at least what we uh, expect from you to do a good amount of exegesis. So when you Write, read the Bible, okay? The Bible is your text that you see right here in the center, uh, your text, your signal, okay? We have the text uh, that we're reading, but this text did not just drop from heaven, right? It didn't uh, drop from heaven, neither was it written overnight. Uh, it's an anthology, a collection of different texts by different writers written at different times to different audiences dealing with a whole bunch of things. So. In exegesis, we essentially have to understand all that before we can say, well, I know what it means. I'm going to apply it to my, to my context. So to help us to do that, uh, when you do exegesis, uh, there are many uh, methods, approaches that you are uh, exposed to. As you can see in these big circles, uh, you can use any of those. But let me, I just group them uh, for convenience. But basically, there are two approaches, two major approaches to exegesis, uh, analytical approaches and engaged or existential approaches. Under analytical approaches, you have the diachronic approach or the historical critical paradigm, where essentially you are trying to understand the history of the world behind this text. What came before behind the text in terms of who, what, when. And then I, uh, you also want to understand uh, the other approach, the synchronic approach, which is uh, the literal paradigm of the history of the world in the text, the world in the text or the world of the text. The text itself wasn't just compiled overnight. Uh, there is a history to the text because uh, in antiquity texts were copied by hand, uh, preserved and transmitted by making copies of copies of copies, uh, which could complicate things uh, in the long run because people you know, made uh, obvious mistakes that you make uh, if you are simply transmitting something by, uh, by, by hand. Uh, so, so under that analytical approach, you have the, the, the diachronic approach, which is uh, the long view of the text and then the synchronic approach. And then the second major approach is the engaged or existential approach or the divine oracle paradigm whereby you are looking at the, the history 
in front of the text. So the same text, uh, now you're looking at you know, once it's published, what is the history in front of the text? How is that text been uh, understood? Uh, so while there may be two major approaches, uh, there are basically a whole bunch of methods under each particular approach. Uh, for example, under the diachronic approach, historical critical methods, you have a method like uh, lower or textual criticism, uh, which is a very basic, very fundamental uh, method of biblical analysis, whereby you're trying to determine whether this text, not even, this is a translation actually, uh, in fact, we are working with the, the Hebrew text, the Hebrew Bible, somewhere on my shelf is there, uh, trying to understand whether uh, that text was the original uh, wording. And it's a very involved uh, process. Uh, we don't actually expect it of you to do, but uh, at least you to know what it is. You would have to know the biblical languages, like Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic and other languages to be able uh, to do that. But it's a very basic uh, approach, which is time consuming. Uh, transmission history, tradition history, composition, who wrote it, where, when, and how, uh, sources, what kind of sources lie behind your biblical text? Were those sources oral, were they written, and how were they transmitted? Uh, reduction, you know, how was the text put together in its final uh, form. And uh, what is historical criticism? Again, that's a kind of an umbrella term for everything, but you can also do a historical critical analysis of a text whereby you look at the history, the setting, the time, the people, places, dates, et cetera. Uh, form criticism, you're looking at genre. What type of text are you looking at? Is it a narrative? Is it a poem? And how do you analyze that text? Uh, even canonical criticism, uh, before the text, is put together, uh, how was it canonized? There's a history to the canon. In other words, there were many religious texts that were circulating in antiquity, but they all compiled and canonized uh, at some point. So all these methods uh, help you to go behind the text to understand what came uh, before your text. Uh, then <clears throat> once you have uh, that little background of the history behind the text, uh, then you can focus uh, on the text itself. Uh, which may be where you are, where again you want to uh, engage the text as a literary product, as a final form, as a published product. And you may use methods like literary criticism or narrative criticism, again, where you are looking at the text uh, as a story. And if it's a story, you know it is, uh, you know, its plot, its outline, its characters, and a particular uh, outline. Uh, some of the methods are also uh, they also overlap. You may want to look at uh, the grammatical aspects of the, of the text, whereby again, you might pick a word and then you do a word study, but that word study will take you to the ancient context. Uh, what is the semantic range? Who used this? What, what did this word mean originally in its context? How was it used over time? By whom? In what context? And what did it mean over that period of time? And what does it mean in this particular context where I'm engaging uh, the text? And uh, how do I use it in my particular text? So uh, even a word study uh, would also uh, uh, give you a lot of information. Uh, structuralism, you are looking at the, the underlying structures of the text, the deep structures, the surface structures, uh, deconstruction, you are breaking it up and putting it back together. A reader response, you know, you are the reader. What, there's no meaning that is ingrained, built within a text, but you as a reader, you find meaning as you read that text. Uh, so what meaning do you find uh, in the reading of the text? Uh, so, but this method is primarily focused on the finished product, the final form of the text. And um, in terms of uh, the engaged methods, these are methods that have been uh, developed by scholars who were uh, left out of the historic, historical critical method because the historical critical method uh, was a method that was pioneered by men, usually German male scholars, and they developed many of the historical critical methods that you find. Uh, but now you have other interpreters, you, you have minorities, you have women, you have people from the two-thirds world, you have people who have grown up under colonialism, and uh, they 
develop uh, newer methods, newer approaches to the text. Uh, methods, uh, for example, like uh, 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 advocacy or ideological criticism, where you, again, you are looking at uh, the, the power relations within a, a text, who is the power, who doesn't have the power. Uh, feminist interpretation, womanist interpretation, uh, the interest, the issue of women. Uh, some of you who are writing projects on uh, you know, women or ministry or mental health issues, uh, you are going to need to know something about you know, womanist exegesis, feminist exegesis. Uh, how are women portrayed in the text? Uh, how do we know about these women? Do these women in the text speak at all? If not, why? Again, as you go through the text, you see that the Bible you know, is a patriarchal uh, text. It was written in a patriarchal context where men's needs uh, take uh, center stage. Uh, so those, all those things are embedded in the text. So what you might be doing uh, as you do feminist exegesis is try to reconstruct the lives of women who are often marginalized within the text. And then you have, uh, you know, womanist interpretation. What is it? When you have uh, African-American women uh, who come to the text and they also bring a different lens, a different perspective. So many of you uh, maybe want to be familiar with that uh, perspective. Uh, Postmodern criticism, post-colonial criticism. Uh, you also have uh, people who we have been through, who have engaged empire, who have seen uh, what uh, sanity has done, European expansionism, imperialism. How has that affected people on the other side of the globe? Some of you have talked about uh, you know, missions, but what does it mean to do missions or to evangelize on the other side for people who have lived under imperial occupation? So a post-colonial lens to a text may give you a very different uh, perspective. Uh, but you don't use all these methods, but you apply the ones that are uh, applicable to your text. So uh, the exegetical process, to do this exegesis, we, we, uh, we find that uh, there are some complicating factors uh, that those of you who've been in biblical studies are familiar with, uh, such as the third party perspective, language, culture, historical gap, writings that developed over time, multiple texts or sacred uh, texts. Uh, just uh, in a nutshell, you, okay, you can see some of my notes that uh, as we read the Bible, we are not reading a text that was written for us or to us directly. We are reading a text that was written to another people at a very uh, different uh, text uh, time. So we are essentially reading someone else, uh, male, uh, or uh, just, just a minute. Uh, uh, so we, we need to understand that as we come to the biblical text, uh, we are engaging the text from a different perspective. Uh, we need to understand the original writers, the original uh, receivers of that text. If you think of Paul's letters, he was writing to certain communities uh, where there were issues and problems, and you need to understand those problems before you can uh, apply that uh, text. Uh, if you look at the text in its original language, you are reading the Bible, not in English. English is just one of the translations. And then you can say, oh, how good is the translation? Well, it's as good as the translator. So this is the reason why you have uh, so many translations of the Bible, because uh, a translation is essentially an interpretation. Uh, but if you wanted to understand the text in its original language, then you'd need to learn some of the biblical languages so that you can uh, read that uh, text uh, on your own. Uh, I teach uh, four Hebrew classes here at semin in seminary. So you might want to you know, start learning your Hebrew, especially if you want to stay in biblical studies or go on to do uh, doctoral work. Uh, you definitely, you'll be required to know the biblical languages. Uh, as we read through the Bible, we see that uh, the culture is different. There are ideas that are very different from uh, what we think they are. Uh, for example, coming from Africa, I know I thought football and soccer were the same thing. So I came to America and I found Americans playing football with their hands. I said, well, that's not uh, football, it should be handball. 
But again, uh, because my context was different, but now that I have lived here, I know the difference. So as you go through the Bible, you find many things that are foreign to our culture, uh, things that relate to sacrifice, or the law of the leverage, uh, infant, infant mortality rates, or patriarchy. Uh, these are things that you need to dig deep to understand what they meant to make sense of them. I don't read them with your 21st century lens, but basically try to go back in time and try to contextualize uh, these things. As you look at the Bible, you are looking at texts that uh, come from the Greco-Roman uh, context, uh, the Hebraic and Greco-Roman context, and uh, we are separated from that context by centuries. So even that text came together over a period of some 1200 to 1500 years. So many things can uh, happen and change in the process of uh, developing a text over that length of period. But again, uh, things change over time. If you think of uh, our history, 50 years ago, it's very different from what it is now, right? Especially because of technological development. So how much change would uh, the biblical text uh, have over that length of, of time? Even the New Testament, okay? Jesus left no writings, didn't write any books or the apostles themselves, but uh, this was a recollection of uh, his life and teachings after uh, he had died because people thought he was going to be coming back. So nobody wrote uh, anything. But again, even if things were written uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years after Jesus uh, died, uh, how much of that recollection uh, would be accurate to what Jesus actually said and, and did. So these writings developed over a lengthy period of time. Uh, they are, they have different uh, styles, different authors. For example, when you look at the Pentateuch, you know, many of you may say, well, the, the Pentateuch was written by Moses because that's what tradition says. Uh, <clears throat> but when you look at the Pentateuch from uh, a historical critical point of view, you find uh, writers like J.E.D.P., the Yahwist, Elohist, Deuteronomist, and the priestly writer who are writers who are writing at different times with different interests to different audiences. And again, uh, that may change our perception of uh, what, who wrote the Bible. Uh, in other words, uh, the Bible is an anthology of different writings from ancient times. And you need to understand that in your exegesis. Uh, the Bible is also a collection of multiple texts or editions of the same text uh, that were preserved over a long period of time. Uh, so when you engage uh, textual criticism, you will see that uh, there are different manuscript traditions. Uh, and some manuscripts, uh, no two manuscripts are, are the same. They are all uh, different. And uh, they were also uh, copied by, by hand. So, uh, <clears throat> Just a minute. So <clears throat> when you look uh, at ancient manuscripts, you see that there are different uh, copies, different traditions, and no two of them look the, look the same. Uh, that's why you engage in textual criticism to try to establish whether uh, the text you are using is the actual original uh, writing. Uh, so you may end up uh, looking at uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is a group of manuscripts that were unearthed um, recently, but they did back to the second century and scholars use that along with the Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek to reconstruct what might have been uh, the most likely original reading of the text. And once scholars have done that, then they can uh, come up with a readable translation for us. So before we have this text, a lot of things have gone on to produce this uh, translation. And again, you just go into a, a bookstore, a library and see how many Bibles there are, how many translations there are. Uh, all that is a result of uh, the work of our scholars. But again, they come to different understandings of that original text. That's why uh, Bibles read differently because it's uh, basically a matter of uh, interpretation. And then uh, finally, you have sacred texts that uh, the Bible is interpreted by people who are Jews or Christians or Muslims. And uh, sometimes we have certain ways of reading or in interpreting the Bible uh, in the Jewish Hebraic tradition. 
the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament makes sense in its own context. But as Christians, we want to see the correlations between the old and the new. As a matter of fact, uh, we can't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. But in the Hebrew Bible, uh, in the Jewish context, the, the Jewish Bible does not have the New Testament. It's sufficient in itself. Uh, so that's why the question of context uh, is important. Now to engage in uh, exegesis, to use those methods that you all see, uh, there are a series of steps that we follow. Uh, there's a book by Michael Gorman, Elements of Biblical Exegesis. Uh, those of you who have been in my class and you're familiar with that, uh, where again, uh, you use sev se several steps. Uh, seven, but sometimes there are 12, sometimes there are 15, depending on the uh, on the exegete. But common has uh, seven steps. Uh, the first one being the, the, the survey of the text, your own preliminary observation of the text. Uh, so as you're looking at your foundations, you, know, you have to make some observations and uh, write down what seems to be going on, what seems to be the main theme and uh, all those things. Then you look at the contextual analysis where you look at the, the history, uh, social, cultural, theological, canonical context of the text, also the literary and the rhetorical context of the text. Uh, so you are looking at various uh, contexts of the text because context is important. Uh, even placement of your text in the Bible is important. Why is your text placed here and for what reason? What purpose is it uh, uh, providing? Uh, what is the history behind this text? Uh, so the context is uh, very, very important in terms of understanding uh, the meaning uh, of your text. So you must understand that first and foremost before you say, uh, now this is what it means uh, in my particular context. You also do uh, form criticism, where again, you look at your text in terms of its form, structure, setting, intention, and movement. Uh, this is genre analysis. What type of text is it? What kind of text? And again, once you know the genre, then you, you have a good idea of what uh, many you might have. Uh, for example, again, if you know that your genre is a comedy, you expect to be entertained. Uh, but if you are reading a tragedy, uh, there will be some uh, sad news uh, in that context. But each form has its own structure, its own outline, its own way of uh, progressing. And again, its own uh, particular intention. Uh, after you do those basic things, then you may come to the detailed analysis where you do your verse by verse analysis, where you analyze everything, turn every stone, uh, analyze every word. And you, again, you may pick uh, words that you might you may want to focus on. But the detailed analysis is you know, the major part of your exegesis, whereby you're trying to put this uh, text together, trying to interpret it in its various contexts, taking its genre together, and uh, trying to understand what it means. Uh, after you do that, then you come to the synthesis whereby you basically uh, identify the main meaning of your text. Uh, this is where you draw the, uh, your, your thesis statement <coughs> that will drive your interpretation. So you do all those things in order to try to arrive at the main point, the key point that you introduce uh, in your exegesis uh, paper. You can't do that without doing all these other things. Uh, but once you do them and you understand what you're dealing with, then you can come back and say, well, now I'm going to write my thesis statement to introduce my paper. And uh, uh, then that will be your guiding light as you do your, your interpretation. Uh, the expansion is simply where you use resources uh, to fill in the gaps because you go through the exegetical process, the six steps without any commentaries, uh, making primary observations. But after you finish, then you come back to do research to fill in the gaps uh, or things that you might, uh, you might uh, have, have, have missed. Uh, <clears throat> and then you conclude your, your text. Uh, so uh, here are some of the things that you do under you know, translate, text or translation. You take a passage, you read it, you look up any significant issues, you make your own translation, compare alternatives, and then you can start a sermon use list if we are are doing this for a uh, uh, preparation. But it is the, the place where you do your translation uh, yourself. Uh, in fact, uh, it is recommended that you uh, not just use a translation, but make up, come up with a translation yourself. But that requires you to know the biblical languages. If you don't know them, that's all right. 
you can consult several Bible translations, lay them side by side, four or five, and then uh, try to pick uh, or use the ones that uh, shed uh, better light uh, on your text. The historical context, examine the historical background of the passage, describe the literal historical setting, examine the foreground and the, of the passage, what comes before, what comes after your passage. Again, uh, that these are part of the contextual analysis, again, where you try to understand the, the, the history of your passage. Uh, the form, again, what is the genre? What is the larger category? And what is the minor category? If you're in the book of Psalms, okay, you're dealing with Psalms. That is just a large uh, blanket term. You want to say, what kind of Psalm are you dealing with? Is it a hymn? Is it a lament? If it's a hymn, why is it sung? A lament, why are people lamenting? So when you dig into the context, you find, well, there may be a reason why somebody is lamenting. There may be a problem. There may be distress. There may be death. There may be oppression. Uh, and then uh, the, the, each form we have its own particular structure. And uh, say somebody is rescued from enemies. Uh, then in, in another point, they might compose uh, another type of psalm, a thanksgiving. Why is this Thanksgiving given? Well, somebody has been in trouble. They've been delivered. Now they have a reason to give thanks. So when you read the text, text that say, give thanks to the Lord, that's the reason why they may be doing that. Uh, grammatical analysis, again, you look at the grammar uh, where you might pick uh, key terms and then you focus uh, on them. You also look at your text in their larger biblical theological context. Uh, where there may be other references to scripture, uh, some scholars call it intertextuality. Uh, where else does your text, uh, is, is, where is it re uh, referred to? Uh, if you are preaching, then you do the application issues. Uh, what, are life issue, what are the life issues in this particular text? And then uh, after you understand your text in this historical, social, cultural, historical context, then you can move on to your, uh, ex, your, your sermon. How do I now apply this text to this audience? So if you are preaching in church, you do exegesis, but you don't simply leave it ex, as exegesis. Uh, you, you engage the text so that uh, uh, your congregation can understand some of the backgrounds, context of your text. Then uh, after that, you can uh, apply your text to, uh, to your audience because your audience comes to hear uh, an application of the text. They want to know what the text means. Uh, what is the message for me today uh, as I look at uh, this text, as I come to church? Uh, so you don't simply leave it with ex an exegesis, as an exegesis, but uh, you apply it. But for the purposes of uh, you know, a seminar paper, you can simply do a fantastic exegesis for your professor, get your A, uh, and that's fine. The application part, uh, that's uh, minor. You can do that perhaps uh, in the last uh, uh, part of your, your, your work. But uh, for preaching purposes, you want to take the next step whereby now you apply. So at this point, you are probably at that uh, preaching moment whereby you want to choose a text and then you want to apply it uh, to your context. But before you do that, you want, there are some things that you need to know. And the things that you need to know about your text are the things that I've gone through this uh, slide uh, to explain. And uh, if you have done biblical studies, exegesis, uh, you have some idea of uh, what this means. But essentially, you want to try to do all of this before you run away with your, with your text. Uh, so do your a good amount of ex exegesis first, which is usually lacking uh, in your papers. And after you do your exegesis, then you can say, well, this is how I'm going to use this particular text because now I understand it. Uh, let me just end by uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, for example, you have uh, the, the Emmanuel sign. OK, let me stop sharing so I can, we can just see each other. Uh, <coughs> Okay, you have the text of Isaiah 7 and 8, right? You're familiar with the Emmanuel uh, text, whereby, you know, Isaiah said, well, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
And if you didn't do a good amount of exegesis, then you can say, ah, oh, well, this text is about prophecy, is prophesying the birth of Jesus. And we usually run to that because uh, when you come, we read the New Testament, right? Matthew, you know, I think around chapter 123 said, well, the, all this happened in order to fulfill what was prophesied by the prophets uh, that uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and equally is them Jesus. Well, what is happening is that uh, Matthew is uh, reading the Hebrew Bible, not in the Hebrew Bible, but in the Greek translation, uh, where uh, the Greek text refers to uh, a, a virgin. The Hebrew Bible simply refers to a young woman of marriageable age. Uh, but Matthew is an interpreter of the Old Testament. He's looking at the Old Testament and prophecies, their mode of interpretation, and they are looking to see the fulfillment of prophecy. So when you read the New Testament, you find many things being fulfilled. But before you even come to fulfillment, you must understand what it meant in its historical context. So if you go back to Isaiah chapter 7, you find that King Ahab is threatened by a coalition and uh, six Isaiah's advice and Isaiah says, well, the Lord will give you a sign. And he, just, he said, well, I don't want to trust the Lord. And he's given three signs anyhow, one of which is the sign of Yeshua Yashub, a remnant shall return. Then Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14, uh, that before this Emmanuel child uh, is able to distinguish between good and evil, because Emmanuel in Hebrew means Emmanuel, God is with us in this crisis, right? So before this child is able to distinguish between good and evil, this crisis that has been formed against you will be demolished. It will be gone. Uh, and then you say, well, how long does it take for a child to recognize the difference between good and evil? No, short period of time. If you go back to uh, Isaiah 7, 8, there's a third sign, the sign of Mahel Shalal Hashbaz uh, that uh, Isaiah, uh, the king is given. And that say, sign also says that before this child is able to speak, to say mama and daddy, this coalition will be destroyed. How long does it take for a child to babble mama, dada? A very short period of time. So that those prophets are given in context in order to encourage the king that uh, don't worry, this crisis will be resolved in a very short period of time. So once you understand that, uh, so when as I made that prophecy, he wasn't thinking of uh, what might happen down the street uh, seven centuries later, eight centuries later with the birth of Jesus, as I was simply focusing on the contemporary situation. Uh, I'm teaching a class on the prophets now and we're learning that the prophets really you know, they, they studied their context, their environment, and on the basis of what was happening, they could predict reasonably what was going to uh, take place. Uh, so that's the context of that particular sign. But as uh, Matthew is in a different context and is an interpreter. Uh, the other example that I have for you is the book of Jonah. You are familiar with Jonah, right? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. And you wonder, well, why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? And most of us say, well, he didn't want to go to Nineveh because the Ninevites were evil. Yeah, sure, they were evil. You know, if you look at Assyrian history, you know, they killed people, they impaled people. Uh, they were very brutal uh, in their regime. So they were feared and they were a hated a nation. Uh, so no wonder why Jonah might not want to go uh, to the Ninevites because they're just an evil people. Uh, however, if you look at that text, uh, at the beginning of the text, uh, especially if you read it uh, in Hebrew, uh, the text says that Jonah is asked to go to Nineveh uh, to uh, uh, preach to the Ninevites, uh, not because they are evil. Uh, the, some of, one of the transitions that they are evil has come up against me. But uh, the way that is usually translated evil also means uh, disaster, calamity, trouble. Uh, so if you take that uh, meaning, uh, he's asked to go to Nineveh because Yahweh is concerned about the disaster, the trouble, the calamity that the Ninevites have experienced. What is that calamity? We don't know. The text is silent. It does not say what it was. But what the text says is that uh, 
Yahweh was concerned about the Ninevites and their disaster, in spite of who the Ninevites were in history, right? Yahweh can simply say, go prophesy, go proclaim the word, even to your enemies. You might not want to go there, but Yahweh tells you to go there anyhow. So we get a very different uh, interpretation uh, when you look at the text uh, in that way, uh, that uh, you know, Yahweh is concerned, not just about Jonah, not just about the Israelites, but even the other people, even if there may be enemies, even if uh, there were people who oppressed the people of God or even uh, brought down, uh, destroyed uh, the Northern Kingdom of, uh, of Israel. So again, uh, context matters. Context informs our interpretation and exegesis helps to flesh out uh, what we might discover in the text. And I'd hope that uh, you are able to do uh, the same uh, with your text so that you can bring new light, shed new light uh, on, your, on your text. All right, <clears throat> that's all I uh, have for my for presentation. Uh, if there are questions, we can discuss them. Dr. Wadafanaka, this is uh, Quinzel Chestnut. Um, mm -hmm. Are we able to get a copy of um, the slides or the notes that you um, put um, out? Yeah, I can. Uh, Share, I can share them with Dr. Flowers. I don't know if I can do that in this screen, but I can send to Dr. Flowers to, to send to you. Yeah, I can do that. All right, thank you. I'll make sure that he, he gives them to you. You're welcome. Other uh, questions about exegesis? I know that uh, all this is twirling in, your, twirling in your mind and uh, thinking, how am I going to use all this? Uh, hopefully you'll find way, ways, but at least uh, you know, find a basic, uh, exegesis book and try to read uh, through it, give some good commentaries and uh, understand uh, the context first. I see- Dr. Walker, Walker. Walker. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. In order. In order. Aaron Jones, what did- I think Rosalind was first. Ms. Hall, Ms. Hall. Oh, Ms. Hall. Oh, um, um, Dr. Wafanaka, you mentioned a, uh, a, a text mm -hmm. when you were talking about you said that um there's a recent text that you suggested that we might want to um look into when as we are working through our um exegesis and your i just couldn't i don't i didn't catch the name of this particular uh, it's, it's, on, it's on the slide you will see the book on the slide it basically it goes through all the uh, it's called the handbook of uh, uh uh, it's called the, uh, let me see. Uh, actually, I, I have that with me. Uh, just, uh, yeah, elements. You ready, to keep, you ready to keep putting it in the chat? Elements of biblical exegesis. You see it uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the slide. But basically, it goes through all the, the seven steps that I was describing, uh, step by step. Uh, so you can glean mm -hmm. through it, and uh, you, you will find uh, ways of doing exegesis. You can also look at the examples at the back of that book to see what an exegesis proper uh, looks like. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Williams? No. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Joey Williams, uh, I see your hand is up. Yes. Uh, uh, I In your presentation, I heard uh, three phrases. I heard Old Testament. I heard Hebrew scripture. I heard Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, in the academy, is there some preference? Is there some different way of saying this? Or is there a preferred academic way of saying this? Or are they just freely interchangeable? Yeah, well, they, they are interchangeable, but uh, preferably, uh, you can use uh, that's, uh, Hebrew scriptures or Greek Hebrew scriptures, uh, Greek script, Hebrew scriptures, uh, and Greek scriptures or Hebrew Bible and uh, New Testament because the language of New Testament, New and Old. Uh, if you think about it, uh, it's almost uh, it's kind of exclusive. Okay, so this is the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. In other words, the, the Old Testament, Old Testament has been superseded by the New. Uh, if you think from a different context, like in Jewish, how does that sound in Jewish ears uh, that their scriptures are old? But if simply say these are the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, 
Uh, that's a more acceptable uh, designation. Hebrew Bible, Greek Bible, than Old Testament and New Testament. We, we tend just to use the terms loosely without uh, thinking about uh, them. Uh, but uh, in scholarly circles, you find reference to Hebrew scriptures or Hebrew Bible, and then uh, Greek scriptures. Uh, Sister Blackman is next. Okay. Thank you, Professor. I, I have a more general question. I just need a little bit of clarity. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we have to have a biblical foundation to our, our work. Uh, does it have to be one text or can we use multiple texts? Um, you can use uh, probably a few texts, two or three texts. Uh, sometimes people might stay with one text, but basically, uh, you want to, especially when you are writing the, the foundations chapter, uh, you want to look at several texts that undergird uh, your project. There may be one that is uh, stronger than the others, uh, but you can use maybe two or three, uh, depending on uh, what you may uh, find. Uh, but don't restrict yourself to just uh, one text, but at least uh, you know two or three uh, that may undergird your, your your project. Thank you. You're welcome. Pastor Jones, Reggie Jones. Thank you. Now, in Georgia, as always, um, the question I, ask, I want to ask you is this. What is the best interpretation of the New Testament in the original language? Is it Aramaic or is it Greek? And can you tell me what the best Bible to get for that? Because I heard yeah. somebody say something about it yesterday. But I, I couldn't find it then. Yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, Jesus probably spoke Aramaic at home. He was a Jew, so he probably spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. But uh, what you realize is that the New Testament was not written uh, in Aramaic. It was, it was written in a foreign language, and that foreign language is Greek. It was written by Greek-speaking people. Uh, so if you want to talk about an original New Testament uh, text, uh, then you can go to Neso Island, uh, New Test, uh, Neso Island, uh, it's called uh, the Greek uh, Testament. I have said some, uh, but Neso Island, they edited the, the Greek, uh, uh, well, this is, this is different, uh, but basically, you have, but it's called Neso Island. I think it's uh, probably it's a twenty eighth edition, but it is the the Greek text of the New Testament. And is it in English, so we can match it up. Does yeah, but, but only if you can read Greek. If only you can read, read. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you can read Greek, then uh, you will need to uh, get a formal translation of the Bible, such as the uh, uh, Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, or uh, the CEB, uh, but the book by Gorman lists uh, which translations are good for exegesis and which are not okay. good for okay. exegesis. Okay, I got that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Apostle. You're welcome. Apostle only love. Other questions? Yes. Um, yes. Professor, I wanted to know, have you heard about the Hebrew manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew that were found? in India from? Uh, no, mm -hmm. I have not heard. Can you shed light on the Hebrew? Yes, so, okay. yeah, so um, there are, and um, they're at, I think the um, University of Tel Aviv, but they were um, gospel manuscripts. Um, there were Hebrew manuscripts of the gospel of Matthew that were found in India from um, okay. among the Indian Christians that were converted by, I don't want to say converted, but I guess Apostle Thomas reached them a very, okay. you know, long time ago. I can put in an article about it in the chat, but um, I think it's the University of Tel Aviv that actually has them and some folks are, um, right. are looking at them now, but I'll put something in the chat about it okay. as well. And um, for my classmates, I'm putting in some translations that I use more like for my personal Bible reading and devotional, um, as far as he good Hebrew translations of the scriptures. The only one that was used in the academic context was the Oxford Annotated 
um, Bible, but just for um, more so for sermon writing and devotional. These are some of the translations I use that are um, more true to the, at least the Hebrew. But Professor, I'll drop that in the chat. Yeah. Well, th thank you for, for that. Uh, that's been interesting. Yeah, well, if you look at translation, make sure you uh, look at the former translations, HarperCollins, uh, NIV, NRSV, uh, not so much the dynamic translations, they tend to be more paraphrastic. Uh, I know you all have the message, but the message is kind of in paraphrase. I mean, uh, Eugene, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, uh, he, he, I mean, he, he came up with a good translation. Eugene, Eugene Peterson. Peterson, Peterson, yeah. You know that's that's a basically it's a good translation, but uh, it primarily it's kind of an interpretive translation way, but it actually interprets what the original text meant. And some of those translations might be meant for people for whom English might not be the first language. Uh, but if you want to be closer to the original Hebrew and Greek, then you want to choose a more formal uh, translation. And uh, to the question of the manuscript, yeah, things are still being unearthed. So if something is unearthed. And that might shed new light on what we know about Jesus, especially since uh, some periods are silent and we don't know what was happening with Jesus at certain points of his life. So that would definitely shed light. And the reference to Thomas being in India, that's why tradition says that he was in India and he was killed in India. So who knows, maybe he might have brought with him uh, a manuscript uh, in, in Hebrew. That would be interesting. And, and Professor, I'm not putting any paraphrases in the chat. The ones that I'm putting are mm -hmm. actually from the, the Hebrew, like not paraphrases. So just for um, clarity, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I don't read paraphrases. <laughs> okay. So like this. All right. Other questions? Uh, Pastor Reggie, do you have another question? Your hand is still up. Your hand is still up. Pastor Reggie Jones. Pastor Reggie Jones, do you have a question? No. Okay, gotcha. No, Anybody no. else have a question that I missed? Dr. Walford, I don't see anyone else that has a question. I just wanted to let you know also, I don't see him today, uh, but we are blessed to have a brother from India in our class named Nathaniel. Um, but I don't see him in today. Um, oh, Nathaniel, I, I, I know that name. I think I've taught uh, that brother. Yes. Nathaniel, I've taught his uh, brother as well. So uh, uh, over my career, I've taught uh, a number of people. I've taught brothers and sisters, siblings, parents, and uh, you name them. I've taught them all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you uh, so much. So I'll give, uh, I've sent that uh, PowerPoint to uh, Dr. Flower so he can share with you. But again, uh, do justice to yourself and uh, make sure you do some amount of exegesis. Try to understand at least what lies behind your, your text. The various Dr. Dr. Walter Fanaka, um, yes. also only love so has her hand up. Okay. No, Where's no, it? no. I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot to put it down. I no thank you, yeah. though. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, Dr. So, Go uh, ahead. So I'm encouraging you to make sure you do some good amount of exegesis. Show that you have at least done some exegesis because sometimes when uh, we get your documents after the defense, uh, one of the things that we usually ask students to do is to go back and do some exegesis uh, because the exegesis is lacking. And when you talk about exegesis, Exegesis is going back and extract, extracting meaning out of text. ICGC is simply putting your own meaning and interpretation in a text without much exegesis. Uh, so we try to encourage students to do exegesis rather than ICGCs. So help yourself by doing the work now. Do some good amount of exegesis, and then you can apply your text. And uh, when you come to the defense, uh, there won't be too many uh, questions. But uh, I want to uh, thank you for your participation. I do have another appointment in five minutes, uh, Walker, but I will send that uh, PowerPoint to Dr. Flowers to share with you. Dr. Walker, yeah, what now? Yes, Everett. Okay, I just want to ask you this question. I know that you know when I had a choice of taking Hebrew uh, uh, for my MDiv, yes. um, it, did not, it, it, it would not have made sense at that time for me as an elective. Um, is that opportunity available in the DMIN program or is that something that you have to do um, outside of that? Um, 
my most of my Hebrew students have been in the MD program, but uh, I don't know if you can take it as an elective. You can ask Dr. Flowers if you can take it in as a as one of your electives, or you can still come back as an alum to take courses at STVU. Uh, I think the tuition will be reduced. You can talk to the registrar about that, uh, but I definitely want to encourage you to you know learn your languages uh, when when you can, either while you're in seminary or after you graduate. Thank you so much. Oh. I'm so sorry, Professor. I didn't fully hear that. Um, are we able to take the class with you as demon or no? Um, well, the class you have to take from the beginning one. You have to take the first one when, when it's being offered uh, on this course schedule. And uh, now I'm already teaching the third course. So uh, you won't be able to take it until next, uh, next year. Uh, but but uh, Dr. Flowers can shed light on that, whether you uh, can uh, do that, but uh, I mean, it might not you know, be quite helpful for your project, but at least uh, biblical studies where you learn exegesis, I think that might be more helpful uh, to your project at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So alums can um, audit the course, and you, if you are not an alum, you can um, talk to Dr. Flowers okay. to, see if you could, to see if you could um, take it as a non-matriculating student, because we do have students who take um, Hebrew as um, non-matriculating students from other um, universities um, for PhD work and other DMAN work. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Jackson has uh, know-how, inform no in inform inside knowledge. You so know. thank you for, for clarifying that. Of uh, course. Amen. All right. All right, I uh, wish you well and be blessed for the rest of your day and uh, best of luck with your projects. I hope to see you, some of you in the defense uh, and uh, hope that you produce uh, a fantastic document. Thank you very much.